The Subcommittee on Energy and Environment will come to order. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's hearing entitled to observe and protect how NOAA procures data for weather forecasting. In front of you are packets containing the written testimony, biographies, and truth and testimony disclosures for today's witness panel. I now recognize myself five minutes for an opening statement. First of all, I want to thank you all for your patience uh, while we were on the floor voting. And I want to welcome everyone to this afternoon's hearing to gain a better understanding of NOAA's approach to procuring data for weather forecasting. Three weeks ago, while testifying before this subcommittee, NOAA Administrator Lubchenco spoke of the tough choices required in developing the administration's fiscal year 2013 budget request, and which, by the way, included an increase in overall funding of 3.1 percent. Each year, the budget requests for satellite programs grow as a percentage of NOAA's total budget request. NOAA's, quote, tough choices have resulted in placing nearly all of its eggs in a single basket, satellite systems fraught with a long history of major problems. These decisions are now causing trade-offs with other valuable networks. Today's hearing is designed to take a closer look at the NOAA process for making those tough choices when it comes to costly observing systems, including how requirements are determined, how data needs are met, and how NOAA research is facilitating better analysis and technologies. We all recognize three things about NOAA and weather forecasting in the future. First, Recent severe storms have reaffirmed that we need to focus limited NOAA resources on preventing the loss of lives and property. Second, NOAA satellite programs have been plagued by scheduled delays, chronic mismanagement, and significant cost overruns. Third, as admitted by NOAA and confirmed by GAO experts, there will be a gap in polar orbiting satellite data in the not too distant future, and Dr. Luchenko told this committee earlier this month that there aren't any quote, viable alternative options. We hope to explore this statement in further detail today. The FY13 budget request provides a perfect illustration of the need to take a closer look at NOAA's process. Satellite programs represent almost 40 percent of the total $5.1 billion budget request, with the result being that programs in other line offices suffer. The decision to invest so heavily in the currently planned space-based remote sensing systems comes at the expense of observing systems that would come at a small fraction of the price. For example, NOAA has made decisions to eliminate or reduce investments in the National Profiler Network, the National Mesonet Network, and the Tsunami Buoy Network. These decisions will affect lives and property and, have not seemed, and do not seem to be based on independent analysis. Knowing the challenges NOAA and the Weather uh, Service faces, it is all the more important that we conduct impartial technical assessments to guarantee that the money we spend on a combination of observing systems gets us the greatest forecasting bang for our buck and that our data procurement is based on cost and benefits rather than subjective thinking. Rather than relying on the whims of an individual administration or the opinions of subject matter experts divorced from fiscal realities or program managers wedded to certain systems, NOAA needs to undertake comprehensive, objective, and quantitative evaluations of observing systems that incorporates cost. There are options available to conduct more thorough analysis of these systems. For example, in a re recent article, Administrator Lubchenco referred to the use of observing sa system simulation experiments, or OSSEs, as a powerful tool, and that's her quote, a powerful tool for evaluating uh, different combinations of observing systems to meet forecasting needs. Unfortunately, NOAA has not used this powerful tool to guide decision-making related to current weather data challenges. The status quo can't continue. We no longer have the budgetary luxury to repeat past mistakes in our approach to procuring data for weather forecasting. NOAA needs to think beyond its current framework on the most cost-effective and efficient way to get data for weather forecasting. Technological advancements in the last two decades make it possible for more information to come from the private sector while still maintaining the level of quality assurance necessary for accurate weather forecasting. Improvements in computer processing and data assimilation allow for different combinations of data to create advanced forecasts. Such progress requires NOAA employ objective analysis to determine the best course forward. I want to thank the witnesses for appearing before the subcommittee and I look forward to a constructive discussion. The chair now recognizes Mr. Miller, the ranking member, for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chairman Harris. Uh, I also want to welcome the witnesses today and thank them for being here to shed light on what has become a protracted problem for NOAA, uh, but one that is now marked by a new urgency. 
Uh, for years, the nation's multi-billion dollar uh, weather and climate satellite program has been the center of this committee's uh, investigations and oversight agenda. Uh, I, I call the, the, the late and unlamented INPOS uh, program the most snake bit pro uh, uh, program in the federal government uh, at a hearing uh, of, the si of the investigations and oversight subcommittee uh, when I chaired uh, that subcommittee. Uh, but despite relentless pressure from both parties to get uh, those programs under control, they have continued to experience cost under overruns and they almost never launch on schedule. Most of those problems, really almost all of those problems, really existed before this administration. They were waiting for the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the desk when the administration, the new administration arrived, but now it is the task of this administration, the Obama administration, uh, to fix those problems. Uh, in addition to uh, being inexcusably wasteful, uh, the programs expose the country to a very real possibility that we will see a gap in our weather and climate forecasting abilities given the expected life of the weather satellites now flying. Uh, from the deadliest tornado in more than half a century to the unprecedented heat, unprecedented heat wave just this month, um, Parts of, almost every part of the country is facing severe, life-threatening, and record-breaking weather events. Uh, good weather data is more important than ever. Yet, um, yes, satellites are expensive, uh, but they are essential to protecting life and property, and the cost of inferior systems uh, could be far greater. Uh, so today we're asking uh, several questions. Is the time frame realistic? Uh, is the attempt to cobble together a, a backup system in the event that our current satellite systems fail <clears throat> as expected based upon their uh, projected, um, uh, their ex expected life um, while we are still waiting for new systems to come online, is all that worth the cost or should we now just rethink our reliance on satellites altogether as some now argue perhaps out of frustration with the many problems in, this, in the satellite programs? Uh, as stewards of the taxpayers' dollars, uh, we have to manage these programs in the most fiscally responsible way while avoiding a reduction of the service and protection we come to expect um, and need. Uh, it also means we have to recognize when we can tinker and we, when we have to take more drastic action. Uh, over the years, talented and innovative researchers and scientists in the public and private sector have developed a wide range of technologies and methods. Uh, weather bu uh, radars, uh, buoys, aerial data, wind profilers, atmospheric sounders uh, that give us both depth and flexibility in anticipating the effects of weather. Uh, what I would like for us to learn today is how uh, these and other technologies uh, can complement the work of the satellites or if when combined they can give us uh, much the same ca uh, capability at less cost. Whatever the answer, we have to be strategic in our, in our decisions, uh, evaluating the benefits of the individual uh, technologies while considering the cost and realistic lead time for their development uh, at this point uh, to avoid a, p a potential weather data gap. Uh, maybe all we can do is cross our fingers and hope that the existing polar satellite lasts beyond its design life, its expected life, uh, and we'll have more time. Uh, to, to get the next satellite successfully launched. But there's no way to plan, that's no way to plan uh, our nation's strategy for advanced weather forecasting, uh, and we have to be prepared not to be that lucky. A weather data gap could occur as early as 2016, assuming the satellite does survive the expected time, uh, which gives us four years to develop, test, and have ready any capability to mitigate the gap. Uh, these are complicated and, ex and expensive systems, and four years is not a long time uh, for such, uh, uh, such an expensive and complicated system. Uh, so I'm interested to hear what NOAA's plans are and what the other witnesses are suggesting as realistic and cost-effective strategies for minimizing the damage of this predicament. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this should be a good hearing on one of the most important aspects of this committee's jurisdiction. Thank you for holding this hearing today. Uh, and for your staff working with my staff. Um, and I look forward to a lively and informative discussion. Um, and I do yield back but wish to raise one minor procedural point that I do not wish to make contentious. Um, but earlier, at an earlier hearing of this subcommittee on hydraulic fracturing, 
uh, an EPA witness uh, arrived to testify with a slide, a PowerPoint, that had not been provided to committee staff. Uh, the, the majority Republicans uh, objected to that and Democrats supported that objection. Uh, we do need to have all the materials uh, from, from the witnesses to prepare properly uh, for these hearings. It may not look like we prepare, uh, but we really do, or at least our staff does. Uh, so we really do need, and I know that there are, there are two witnesses on the second panel who have arrived today with PowerPoint presentations. Uh, our staff has reviewed those. They're, they're generally unobjectionable. They are unobjectionable, uh, but it's a procedural matter. We really do need to have those in, in the future. Uh, and this matter today, that it is not a point of contention, could be a, a contentious point at some point in the future. So I, I hope we will work together to make sure that that does not happen again. Yeah, I want to thank the gentleman from North Carolina for bringing that to our attention, and we'll work uh, to see that it, uh, you know, that it happens uh, the way it should, uh, should happen, which is that the witnesses provide everything uh, for review prior, and we'll, of course, share it. Uh, with, uh, we'll share it amongst the, ourselves, whichever witnesses it happens to be. Uh, and thank you. Again, thanks again to the gentleman from North Carolina for bringing it to my attention. Uh, if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses for the first panel. First witness is Ms. Mary uh, Kiza, the Assistant Administrator of the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service at NOAA. Before coming to NOAA, Ms. Kiza was the Associate Deputy Administrator for Systems Integration at NASA. Our next witness would be uh, Dr. Alexander McDonald, the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Research Laboratories and Cooperative Institutes at the Office of Oceanic and Atmospheric Research at NOAA. Dr. McDonald served as Acting Director for the Earth System Research Laboratory and Director of the ESRL Global Systems Division during the consolidation of the Boulder Laboratories into the Earth System Research Laboratory in 2006. Uh, the final witness on the panel is uh, Mr. John Murphy, Chief of the Programs and Plan Division of the National Weather Service at NOAA. Mr. Murphy joined the National Weather Service after serving more than 29 years with the United States Air Force as a career meteorologist. I want to thank all of you for appearing before the subcommittee today. I do again want to apologize for the delay, but we're not in charge of the House schedule. Uh, it's my understanding that Ms. Kiza will present one testimony on behalf of all three of the NOAA witnesses before us. However, all three of the witnesses will be available to answer the question of members during the question and answer period for this panel. As our witness should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes, after which the members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. I now recognize Ms. Kiza to present testimony for the three witnesses on this panel. Thank you. Chairman Harris, Ranking Member Miller, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Mary Kiza, Assistant Administrator for NOAA's Satellite and Information Services, and this afternoon my NOAA colleagues, Dr. Sandy McDonald, Dr. Mr. John Murphy, and I will discuss how NOAA determines its observation needs to support our mission, how we identify mechanisms to fill those needs, and what tools we use to optimize the appropriate mix of systems that are used to deliver the data required. NOAA's mission to provide science, service, and stewardship to the nation is fundamentally dependent on assured access to environmental observations. Our observing requirements are derived from the needs of our research and operational programs. These observations are critical for developing forecasts and warnings that are vital to protecting life and property, and promoting economic productivity. Because no single source can provide all the data needed, NOAA integrates data from both in situ platforms and remotely sensed platforms, such as aircraft and satellites. While acquisition of observational data is funded from all of NOAA's line and program offices, the NOAA Observing Systems Council coordinates the processes for determining the best and most cost-effective means of acquiring the data. As a vice chair of the NOSC, I participate in the ongoing assessment of NOAA's observing system portfolio and the development of recommendations made to NOAA leadership regarding capabilities needed to meet our mission. The NOSC accomplishes this by ensuring that all of NOAA's observational requirements are identified, documented, and prioritized, that the requirements are verified, validated, and regularly updated, and that the means to acquire the data to satisfy these requirements are regularly assessed. This assessment includes a determination of whether the validated requirement for an observation can be met through existing or planned NOAA platforms or through partnering with other federal agencies, academic institutions, or state or local governments. We've made extensive use of partnerships with other space agencies, both nationally and internationally, to meet our requirements. These partnerships allow for mutual, full, and open access to data and are beneficial for all parties in terms of reducing cost and risk. 
NOAA has processes to assure the availability and viability of data from commercial sources, and we routinely purchase data and services from the commercial sector. We'll continue to pursue agreements with the commercial sector when it can provide data that addresses our requirements at an acceptable level of cost and risk. NOAA regularly evaluates new observing capabilities as a way of meeting our requirements or reducing cost. Let me turn to the tools that we use to evaluate observing systems against validated requirements. NOAA uses formal technical studies called analyses of alternatives, or AOAs. AOAs assess the technical feasibility and maturity of various concepts and examine the cost, schedule, and risk associated with implementing each concept. NOAA also uses computer models similar to our current operational weather prediction system to estimate the impact of new observing systems or changes to existing observing systems to our operational forecasts. One modeling tool is called observing system experiments or data denial experiments. This involves systematically adding or denying an existing observation to a historical forecast to determine the difference that action would have caused to the forecast accuracy. Data denial experiments confirm that without polar orbiting satellite data for the snow again in snow event of February 2010, the forecast would have significantly underestimated the amount of snow and the storm's track. Another more advanced modeling tool NOAA currently uses is called adjoint sensitivity experiments. These experiments quantify the contribution of a group of existing observations to the overall reduction in forecast error. These efforts are more sophisticated in that they look at a greater number of observations to determine their impact on the forecast accuracy. NOAA has recently expanded its use of still more sophisticated modeling tools to examine the benefit of potential future systems, systems that don't currently exist. These tools are called Observing System Simulation Experiments, or OSSEs. OSSEs examine future systems to determine their relative benefit in improving future forecasts. This tool involves the use of multiple models and is used to inform decision makers prior to investing in a completely new observing system. Each of the modeling tools has their strengths and weaknesses and we continue to both apply these models and refine them so, to support, so as to support our investment decisions. They're used in conjunction with other programmatic information like cost, risk, and schedule to inform decisions we make in fielding existing observational capabilities or in planning for new capabilities. In conclusion, recognizing the current austere fiscal environment we face, NOAA is working within its means using a range of tools to support its investment decisions. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and my colleagues and I will now answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I want to thank the witnesses for being available for the questioning today. Reminding members that committee rules limit questioning to five minutes. The chair at this point will open the first round of questions for this panel, and I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, and the question, I guess, to whoever is thinks they're best suited to answer, you know, the testimony as well as past testimony of GAO has indicated that even if the joint polar satellite system is fully funded, there will be a data gap uh, from polar orbiting satellites for potentially several years. And a few weeks ago, the administrator, as I said, testified that we don't believe there are any viable options to obtaining the data necessary for weather forecasting. Is this statement a subjective opinion, or in fact, is there objective, uh, or is it based on objective fact? Has, has NOAA actually uh, undertaken a quantitative analytical study that concluded there's no viable alternative to mitigate the expected data gap, or is this just the, uh, again, kind of a subjective feeling? Uh, what alternatives were evaluated and deemed not to be viable alternatives? So specifically, what was looked at? And uh, Ms. Kiesa, maybe you can comment on that. Sure. What I'd like to do is talk about the gap first, and then I'll talk about the, the tools we use to evaluate sure. the the gap itself, and it is an objective statement on the part of the administrator. So the gap, the concern about the gap is the time between uh, the end of an NPP mission, the current orbiting satellite, um, and the onset of the JPSS-1 experiment. The NPP has got a design life, contractual design life of five years. It launched in late 2011. The end of the five-year design life will be 2016. The JPSS-1 satellite is scheduled to um, launch not earlier than second quarter of uh, fiscal year 2017. So it's a small physical gap in terms of when two satellites are on orbit, but the concern we have is that we need overlap of the measurements. We want to cross calibrate between the measurements on NPP, on the instruments on NPP, and the instruments on JPSS-1. 
depending on the complexity of the instrument, it takes different amounts of time to fully calibrate the instrument. Some instruments can be calibrated within six months. Other, men, other instruments may take 12 months or longer to calibrate. So we want overlap of those instruments. In terms of the, the, the capabilities that NPP represents, it provides a continuity of the capability we are currently utilizing now to support our weather forecasts. That includes both our current polar satellites, the POSE series of satellites, as well as the NASA capability that's afforded by the EOS platforms. So NPP provides continuity of that. JPSS will be, provide continuity beyond NPP. When we look at the implications of, of um, denying capability from an on-orbit forecast, that's the, the data denial experiments I referred to earlier, that's what we've looked about, at in terms of saying there will be a gap based on the time it takes to calibrate and the relative um, contribution of those instruments to the weather forecast. Well, let me just clear something up for you. If, if one of the satellites is going offline potentially in 2016 and the other one not coming on until 2017, there, is, there will be no overlap. I mean, how do you calibrate against a satellite that's not functioning? When we, when we talk about the contracted life, that's, what's, that's what is written in the contract specification. We will see how this spacecraft performs. It may last longer. The spacecraft itself may last longer than the contracted for performance, but we can't plan on that. So if it doesn't, then there is no overlap at all in order to calibrate one then against the other? Then we would fall back on any other assets that are available, and we already have agreements in place with our European counterparts for the mid-morning orbit. We back each other up so that if we lose capability in the afternoon orbit, we can continue to pull in data from the Europeans' mid-morning orbit. Additionally, we will have any other assets that may be available. So the NPP satellite is, is one of the assets that are there. Older POSE satellites, portions of those satellites and instrument capability may continue to operate online. We'll, we, we keep those in orbit and continue to nurse those as they get older. So we'll take advantage of whatever, whatever assets we have at that time frame. And, but it is possible that there may be nothing to calibrate them against directly. There is, there is a possibility that there would be nothing to calibrate them, so, them against in that orbit other than in situ measurements right. that we take from the ground. Okay, thank you. Dr. McDonald, what, is, what are some of the areas of research and technology development that could enhance our ability to protect against severe weather, and how much would they cost to undertake? Uh, Congressman, there's several uh, new exciting areas of research that we've been working on. One of them is uh, that we know our models are crucial, uh, and there's a really uh, exciting advance in our ability to do uh, modeling using these new kinds of computers based on graphics processor units. So we're working hard on that research. Uh, we know has been funding for several years uh, the unmanned aircraft program looking at how we can really address the severe weather prediction uh, and other capabilities uh, using this new type of technology that we've learned so much about with. Um, we also are putting in new capabilities with our radars, for example, the uh, um, uh, radar system is being uh, upgraded and uh, we're putting in what's called dual polarization and we have a, a, a group that studies that and tries to improve our severe weather prediction in that way. So uh, we have uh, a, a lot of tools and as, uh, uh, as Mary Kiza mentioned, we're also uh, looking at ways of looking at our observing systems using all these tools that she mentioned. Now, you, the budget, and just one brief, and then I'll turn it over to the ranking member. Uh, the weather research is flat at about $69 million in the budget, but the climate research actually increases in three times as much. Uh, are there opportunities, given the budgetary constraint, I mean, are there opportunities that, we're, that we can't investigate fully because of budgetary constraints? I think we, uh, we at my level, work as hard as we can with the funds we're provided, and, and that's what we're doing. We're, we, okay. We, uh, Thank you very much. Mr. Miller. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Kiesa, uh, I understand NOAA's uh, infrastructure does make it possible to collect various data using technologies other than satellites, uh, radar, uh, 
data buoys, wind profilers, all I mentioned in my opening statement, um, on the ground and, and also other surface observing systems. Um, how important are all those technologies in comparison to the uh, capabilities uh, that we now have with, with satellites? And um, how do the capabilities of satellites and those other technologies depend upon each other? Can they operate independently or do they really need to uh, act in concert, work in concert? They do need to to act in concert. It's not one or the other, it's actually both. They complement one another. If you um, look at uh, today's weather forecast modeling capabilities, satellites on the whole contribute about 94 percent of the input into our weather forecasting models. The in situ um, contrib contribute the additional 6 percent. Um, of the satellites, the polar orbiters con contribute about 84 percent the geostationary about 10 percent, um, but both are important to the overall forecast models. Okay. Ms. McDonald, um, Mr. Murphy, either of you have anything to add? To um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. I'd just like to add that the in situ, I mean, like Ms. Ms. Kiza says, that they're complementary. The, uh, there's the modeling aspect of it, but then there's also the forecasting aspect on the ground to put out a weather forecasts and warnings, and the in situ uh, observations play a key part in in the forecasting of uh, of our tornado warnings and such. Okay. Um, I also have a question uh, about the 2013 budget proposal request from the administration. Um, and given the extreme weather events that um, almost every state and all, almost every district has um, experienced this year, including in my district, uh, there were there was a tornado uh, that uh, resulted in the death of uh, several children. Um, and there have been weather events, extreme weather events all over the country. Uh, particularly given that we are looking at the possibility of a gap in our weather forecasting, um, the, I have to ask about the criteria that in, in making the uh, decisions on what to cut and it seems that we, uh, the proposal does cut some of these other systems that do complement, that do need to work with um, our satellite, even assuming that we do have, the, the satellite uh, proves to have a longer uh, useful life than we project, and, and even assuming that the Europeans will be able to continue to provide us data, it seems like uh, those other systems are all the more important, but the but the proposal would cut the wind profile of the, is it called Mesonet, Mesonet uh, networks. Um, how did you make that, uh, Ms. Kiesa, how did the administration make that decision uh, to propose cutting those systems and what will that do uh, to our forecasting ability um, given all the other uncertainty about the satellites? I'm going to start and then I'm going to ask Dr. Murphy or Mr. Murphy to uh, augment what I have to say. When NOAA looks at its observing capabilities, it looks at the entire portfolio and the relative contribution that each element of that observational portfolio contributes. As I, as I indicated earlier, the satellites um, represent a huge contribution to our weather forecasting capabilities. But systematically, we look at the overall portfolio, and through these types of experimental um, simulation tools I've, I've mentioned previously, we understand the relative contribution of each of those capabilities and use that information combined with our situation in terms of programmatic cost, risk, and schedule to make the determinations that we make in coming forward with budget recommendations. Uh, I'll offer Mr. Murphy any additional comments. Yes, as uh, Mr. Miller, as uh, Ms. Keys had pointed out, um, we look very carefully at the portfolio and we basically categorize our observation systems and we look at them in two ways. They're critical to the functions we need to perform or they're supplementary. That doesn't mean that they don't add value. It just means that they're not critical to our ability to put out our forecasts and warnings. Um, in, the case, in the case of Mesonet and um, uh, the, the, the profilers, uh, we see those as uh, gap fillers between our ray obs and our and our regular reporting uh, fixed ground sites. Um, the primary tool that we use to issue our warnings is the Doppler radar. So 
and the uh, Dr. McDonald mentioned the dual polarization upgrade. What that allows us to do is see greater fidelity and, and better, get better understanding of storm structure. And that's allowing us, we, we believe, to increase our lead times and lower our false alarm rates. So that's, that's, that's how we're accounting for that. Um, there, I know that in addition to the government weather forecasting uh, efforts, there are a good many universities, uh, researchers, uh, others in the private sector uh, at businesses um, that do rely upon the data uh, that you all collect and generate. Um, were they consulted uh, in the decision uh, to cut the uh, budgets for uh, those uh, weather forecasting um, tools? Uh, Mr. Miller, that, I don't believe they were consulted. Our, our, uh, our mandate is to collect the data f to provide our services uh, for life and property and protect the infrastructure of the nation. Uh, we do share the information freely with our uh, commercial partners and, and academia and so forth, but uh, we, don't, we don't collect the data for them necessarily. Okay. Uh, Mr. Murphy, was your office consulted in, that, in the preparation of that budget request? Um, I participated in the exercise that Ms. Kiza pointed out that the NOSC conducted where we looked at all the observation systems and, and we, we prioritized all our observation systems and, and that was, uh, again, validated by the NOSC. Okay. My time has expired. Um, the uh, chairman of the committee, Mr. Hall, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last week, Ambassador Lucino testified to the Appropriations Committee. She'd convened a group to evaluate sources of environmental data and to examine how NOAA can best utilize observing assets at the cheapest price. Uh, Ms. Keisha, when, when will this analysis be complete? I think that Dr. Lubchenco was referring to the fact that under the NOAA Science Advisory Board, we convened a satellite uh, task force or working group to uh, examine with us lower cost approaches to both fielding the space segments and the ground segments. For I don't really know what she was thinking, but uh, I am told that NOAA failed to conduct such an analysis before submitting a budget request, and that should have made a significant decision regarding these systems. I, I'm sorry, I'm referring to the, the task force that she was referring to, and that will be reporting to the NOAA Science Advisory Board in July. In terms of making the budget recommendations for the fiscal year 13 budget, she consulted with all of her line organizations as well as took the recommendations of the NOAA Observing System Council into account in formulating that budget. She did conduct the analysis, though, before submitting a budget request, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yes. Do you know why? Do you have any idea why she did? Why, uh, why she shouldn't have? For, for each budget cycle and development, there's a um, structured process yeah, of consultation. Will this analysis incorporate objective, quantitative evaluations and comparisons of observing systems on the basis of COST cost? Yes. The ongoing analysis that NOAA employs to determine its observational requirements and its funding recommendations, its investment recommendation, recommendations, employs all of the tools that I've previously mentioned. Talk about commercial options for providing weather data. At, at least nine other uh, built, uh, U.S. built commercial satellites are launched every year. I think that's a fairly close estimate. Uh, the reliability of these uh, satellites is pretty well established. If the government uh, has weather missions that could be included on these satellites to the benefit of all parties, it seems to me that that would be a cost-effective option. Is, is that unreasonable? No, sir, it is not. In the past, NOAA's considered this and other commercial options. It might not work for all of NOAA's missions, but the potential benefits and cost savings seems too great to pass up. Yes, sir. And when we um, look at alternatives to meeting our operational observational requirements, we do consider all sources. We do, in fact, purchase commercial data now 
to augment our, our forecasting activities. Um, each of our analysis of alternatives generally does include commercial options as well. When we make a decision, it's based on both the technical maturity and feasibility of the option, as well as the cost and the risk. Can you tell me why NOAA is not pursuing commercial payload options to get necessary weather data? As I had said, we do currently employ commercial services and options for purchase of data, and we explore options in nearly every exercise that we go through uh, before making a determination. Well, my time's about up. Let me ask you, will you provide a committee uh, with the committee a summary and writing of NOAA's analysis and efforts to consider these commercially hosted Yes, sir, options? I would be happy to do so. I right, thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair recognized the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you. Our uh, military obviously has an acute need for uh, accurate weather forecasting. It's my understanding that because of budget constraints that we are canceling or proposing to abort a troubled weather satellite program in the Department of Defense. Can you tell us how what NOAA does relates to what DOD does in the collecting of data for weather forecasting, how you share this information to minimize uh, cost, and are there assets that NOAA has that could fill the gap that will be there because the Pentagon is aborting this troubled weather satellite program? Yes, sir. Let me talk for a minute about um, my understanding of the situation. In the FY12 budget appropriations, the DOD was instructed to terminate the contracts associated with the DWSS, Defense Weather Satellite System. At the same time, they were given funds to explore the next system in, in the wake of that. Um, that uh, is being conducted. They're currently in the process of reevaluating their requirements and conducting an analysis of alternatives. We are working in conjunction with them. Uh, for the weather satellite system, there are three orbits that are of interest, um, and there are, have been traditional roles in who handles each orbit. The military handles the early morning orbit. We rely on our partners, UMETSAT, for the mid-morning orbit, and NOAA, in partnership with NASA, covers the afternoon orbit. All of the information from these orbits is available to all of the partners and is used in their uh, weather prediction systems. The predominant orbit for our weather prediction is our orbit. When I say our, the United States is the afternoon orbit, and that's made available to the DOD as they do with their weather predictions. I'll ask Mr. Murphy to augment. I would just add that the uh, DOD also has um, two, two spacecraft in the barn, so to speak. They, they, their DMSP program has uh, uh, F-19 and F-20, um, so they'll fly that out into the 20s, which allows them the time to do the analysis of, of alternatives. So they're begin they'll be flying that morning orbit for a, a, a bit longer. Um, so it's, th this is not a crisis. Um, we do share data back and forth. Uh, we, we collaborate in many forums, both in modeling and in sharing data. Does DOD not have uh, satellites in polar orbit? The, the, the DWSS, that, that, is, that was a polar orbit. They do not have geostationary. I thought that it was the polar orbiting satellites that were compromising your forecasting? The DOD flies in the early morning orbit. Their current satellite series is called the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program, the DMSP series of satellites. <coughs> Those are currently operational, and in fact, NOAA, on a reimbursable basis, operates those satellites for DOD from our NOAA satellite operations facility. What Mr. Murphy had indicated is that they still have two on the ground, so they've got time before they introduce their next generation, and they're in an analysis of alternatives um, uh, mode right now for that next generation capability. So you will not have lost all of your polar orbiting satellites with this gap? No, sir, we will not. We will still have the, the DOD early morning orbit. 
the UMETSAT, the European is covering the mid-morning orbit. Our concern is about the gap for a period of time, the potential gap for a period of time between the NPP satellite, which we launched last October, and which is operating successfully on orbit now, and the first of the JPSS satellites, which is scheduled to launch in early 2017. So we still have considerable data from polar orbits, but not all we would like. Is that where we are? We, have, we currently have a robust constellation in orbit now. We're concerned about the longevity of that constellation in the 2016-2017 timeframe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you. And I, I have one other brief question, so I'm going to yield myself two minutes, and I'll yield the uh, ranking member. Uh, Mr. Murphy, I have a question for you. With regards to severe weather prioritization, the ones that a lot of average Americans are worried about, um, the types of weather events that cause loss of life, are polar orbiting satellites versus Earth-based measuring devices the best approach to improve forecasting for those events? Because, again, in the context, you know, the budget kind of emphasize everything on these uh, polar orbiting satellites, but are they really the best way versus ground, uh, Earth-based? Um, Mr. Chairman, um, as, as Ms. Kiesa pointed out, the JPSS, or the polar orbiters, provide the, the bulk of the forecast model input. Um, so where that's important is in the longer range, two to five day period. So they give, they give us the ability to forecast that there's going to be a severe weather outbreak in, in Missouri in several days. Uh, that allows emergency managers and local officials to prepare. Um, in terms of the warnings, that's when you really have to depend on the in situ or our primary tool, which I mentioned was the dual pole or the Doppler radar to issue our warnings. Was, and that's not, obviously not polar satellite based. Those are that's ground earth based. So, so in essence, if, if we want to maintain the, that early, the, the zero to two day warning, then what we really need is we have to make sure that our in situ tech, techniques are state of the art. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. And I'll yield two minutes to the ranking member. Uh, thank you. Uh, a further question about the ground observation uh, platforms, or as, I, as you referred to them in, in your testimony, I said the in situ, situ um, observation um, platforms are scarce in polar and ocean environments, I assume because they require being in a fixed place and the oceans and the, and the ice of the polar regions will not sit still for us. Uh, so uh, are you, uh, is it possible or cost effective to actually have more in situ um, observation platforms in polar regions or, uh, and oceans or are those problems just uh, insufferable? I, I can't hear you, but you. I said I will start, and I will let Mr. Murphy augment. Um, the beauty of the satellite observations are that they are global, um, so there there is. I guess literally you could do it, but physically it's nearly impossible to have the coverage with with in situ buoys, um, and they in and of themselves require a lot of maintenance and upkeep, and so that's that pr presents a problem in and of itself. But they are important in terms of their in situ capabilities. So as I said, they, they supplement, they augment, they're complementary too. Um, Mr. Murphy, would you like to? Well, they're not a replacement. They do not replace. Yes, and, and we pretty much depend on whoever owns the territory to, to pretty much you know, take care of the in situ observation. In the case of oceans, we've, uh, NOAA is, is looking at, at you know, UAS, uh, uh, unmanned uh, water gliders, they're called. Uh, to take uh, ocean and, and potentially some atmospheric observations uh, in lieu of the buoys that are a maintenance challenge. So um, I, I think we're doing what we can and what's practical in, in, in very remote and, and hard to get to places. And I will offer one additional comment. There are a number of buoys and it's an international activity. Uh, the Argo has on the order of 3,000, I believe. So it's not a small number of buoys that are internationally shared. And the satellites, again, provide the, the bent pipe communications path for retrieving that data and then sending it down to where it needs to go. Okay. My time has expired. Gentlemen's time has expired. Does anybody else want to be heard? 
I want to thank the panel for the very valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the committee may have additional questions for you and ask you to respond to those in writing in a reasonable time. I'd like to have them in about two weeks if we could. Let me uh, note to the committee that the committee has not received NOAA's written responses to follow-up questions asked of NOAA Deputy Administrator Kathy Sullivan after last September's hearing in uh, polar satellites. These questions were sent more than five months ago. The delay is unacceptable, and we expect each of the three witnesses here today to deliver a timely response to these questions. Are you able to do that? Yes, sir. I'm going to recognize you for five minutes. <laughs> I'm ready to go. They say no, no. Uh, witnesses are excused, and we'll Thank move to the second panel. <laughs> Hell, I won't give her a chance to do it. She might have been the one. She might have been able to answer this. Better than you. Witnesses are excused, and we thank you very much for your time. We move to our second panel. Are you gentlemen ready to proceed? Uh, the first witness on our second panel is Mr. Eric Webster, uh, Vice President and Director of Weather Systems, ITT, Exilis. Uh, Mr. Webster directly oversees Exilis Weather and Climate uh, Satellite Instrument Business Unit, which includes instruments for NOVA, uh, NASA, geostationary and polar orbiting programs, NASA, Earth Science and International Customers. Our next witness is Dr. David Crane, Chief Executive Officer of GeoMet Watch. Prior to his work with GeoMet Watch, Dr. Crane was a senior program manager at Space Dynamics Laboratory where the, he oversaw the sensor development activity. Our third witness is Mr. Bruce Lev, Vice Chairman of AirDAT LLC. Prior to this, he was Vice Chairman and Director of USCO Logistics, which business was sold to global freight forwarder Kuhn and Nagel in 2001. Our final witness, our, our last witness, is Dr. Baron Moore, Dean of the University of Oklahoma College of Atmospheric and Geographic Sciences and the Director National Weather Centers. Prior to joining the University of Oklahoma, Dr. Moore served as Executive Director of Climate Central a nonprofit uh, organization based in Princeton, New Jersey, and Palo Alto, California. 
As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes, after which the members of the committee have five minutes each to ask questions. I now recognize our first witness, Mr. Webster, to present his testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Hall, uh, Ranking Member Miller, uh, and staff. My name is Eric Webster, and I manage the weather system business at ITT Excellus. I appreciate your leadership and efforts to examine how NOAA procures data for weather forecasting. This is sort of a homecoming for me, Mr. Chairman, as I was privileged to be a staffer on this committee for five years under Chairman Bollert and helped lead the examinations into NOAA's weather satellite programs. I then served in the uh, George W. Bush administration as NOAA's head of Congressional Affairs and a senior policy advisor on weather satellites. During that time, the committee conducted 12 NOAA satellite oversight hearings, and I still have the scars to prove it. Um, my position at ITT Excellus has brought me full circle, as now I actually oversee the building of next generation instruments for both GOZAR and the JPSS programs. There are two major types of instruments flying in space in two different orbits. To generalize, it's the imagers on geostationary satellites flying 22,300 miles above the Earth staring at the U.S. and taking pictures of clouds, water vapor, and gathering other information on the surface, which are critical to near-term severe weather forecasting. The pictures that you see on TV or the Internet of hurricanes usually come from the imagers on geostationary satellites. The sounding instruments on polar satellites fly about 520 miles above the Earth from pole to pole, taking three-dimensional pictures of the atmospheric column from space to near surface. Understanding the atmospheric column is important because it's where weather is created, it gets mixed, it moves, and it evolves. As was stated earlier, these measurements are crucial to global weather models and for our two to five day forecasts. So our ability to know several days in advance of a potential tornado or a large snow event is mostly because of polar sounders. Our engineers and workers in Fort Wayne, Indiana have an impressive record of building every imager and every sounder for NOAA's legacy polar satellite programs since the 1970s, including the next generation polar sounding instrument flying today on NPP and for the JPSS program. Our folks have also built every imager and every sounder for NOAA's geostationary program since the 1990s, including the advanced imager for GOZAR. That's a total of more than 50 instruments without one major systems failure. So as if you will, we're the Cal Ripkins of the space-based sensors um, when he was still at his prime. As such, we also have some experience with the contracting process. Requirements for observation systems should be driven by scientific tools and experiments to maximize capabilities and overall effectiveness. These tools with proper oversight and funding can help prioritize unmet needs. However, they will not fix many of the problems in the actual design and procurement of observing systems. In the case of GOZAR, systems requirements were determined over a course of a three-year formulation phase involving industry teams and a review team of NASA and NOAA representatives. All the parties went through an iterative process whereby industry did cost and performance trades and presented the results back to NASA and NOAA. For the GOZAR imager, the process worked as requirements remained stable and we are in production on the first flight unit expected to be delivered next year. But it took $100 million just in formulation studies and 10 years to get here. For the Gozar sounder, the situation was different. Requirements were never really solidified and too many competing priorities were being asked of one instrument. The cost and development of the instrument and the cost to assimilate the data into user products kept growing. Thus the decision was made to cancel the Geo sounder instrument and at the time I believe it was the right decision. NOAA and NASA must find ways to reduce the overall systems costs, as the current GOZAR and JPSS programs are likely unsustainable. GOZAR is $8 billion for two satellites, sensors, ground systems, and operations. The imager, which is a significant increase in technological capability, is less than 10% of the total program cost. The JPSS program is $13 billion for two main sensors, or two main satellites, sensors, ground systems and operations. While amortizing out to the mid-2020s can lessen the sting of the total price tag, these costs are having a tremendous effect on NOAA's missions today and probably assuring no new observing systems, especially from space, can be acquired. In summary, space-based sensors are critical to weather forecasting, both for global weather models and severe warnings. NOAA should increase its use of scientific tools 
to determine requirements, but more than ever, hard choices have to be made. NOAA must examine different procurement models for space-based sensors, such as fixed price or modifying existing instruments to meet requirements at lower costs and lower risks. Given the difficulties in turning these requirements into actual observing systems, NOAA will also have to rely more on commercial capabilities into the future to improve weather forecasts, whether it's advanced geosounders from space or mesonets from the ground. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify. Mr. Webster, thank you. And does anybody ever tell you that you kind of took on some of Mr. Bullard's expressions? Uh, no, no, sir, but I appreciate the compliment. Thank you. You know, he was a Republican chairman. I was a ranking Democrat then. Yes, sir. The book on us was that uh, I kept him from saving all the whales and, and uh, hugging trees, and he kept me from drilling on cemeteries. Yes, sir. That's true. <laughs> he was a good guy, hard worker. Yes. Mr. Dr. Crane, I recognize you now for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and members of the committee, and a uh, senior member, um, for inviting me to testify today. I'm honored to discuss uh, the role of geostationary advanced sounding and how commercial approaches can help NOAA meet the country's observational needs. Today's budget and the programmatic challenges faced by NOAA satellite programs present a perfect opportunity to implement commercial alternatives as a means to provide essential data needed to improve severe weather forecasting. A commercial approach building on critical government technology investments that have already been made combined with private industry and experienced universities provides an affordable means for NOAA to protect lives at a price the nation can afford. Commercial capabilities can complement existing and future NOAA systems to provide the best value solution. One way in, that, in which these private sector capabilities can be quantified and assessed is through the use of observing system simulation experiments, as you've heard in previous testimony. We encourage NOAA to carry out OSSI experiments to validate the system that I will discuss today. If you look at slide one, just for background, our current operational weather systems rely on technology developed over 30 years ago. The current POSE, DMSP, and GOES satellites were developed in the 80s and 90s. Uh, part of the rationale for both the JPSS, MPOSE, and GOES-R programs was to implement new technology that would dramatically improve the capability to forecast and predict severe weather, not just continue with the old, implement new important technology. One of the key technology improvements on both systems was hyperspectral sounding. The role of sounders on both LEO and GEO platforms is to produce vertical profiles of atmospheric water vapor temperature and pressure. Hyperspectral sounders dramatically increase the vertical resolution and accuracy of these profiles uh, over previous sounders. These profiles are the essential data products needed for every forecast. In fact, Dr. Kathy Sullivan in previous testimony before this committee stated that sounding data are the essential lifeblood of weather forecasting. For this and other reasons, the advanced hyperspectral sounder was identified as a primary mission in the process described by Eric uh, when the GOES-R program was authorized. And, and when it was authorized, it was originally slated to have two primary instruments, an, an advanced imager and an advanced sounder. The roles of the two, imager, the two instruments are complementary but different. The imager tells you what the weather is going to be now. The sounder tells you what the weather is going to be six hours from now. Uh, severe weather events that have occurred over the last several years really underscore the benefits of the advanced geostationary sounder. And they include extending warning times from minutes to hours for tornadoes and thunderstorms, uh, avoiding many of the 500 deaths we had in the 2011 season, improve hurricane track and intensity forecast, avoiding unnecessary evacuations like we had with Irene and uh, Rita, improve the routing of aircraft, significantly reducing uh, weather delays for passengers, uh, allowing the airlines to, to uh, manage their fuel and routing more efficiently. All of these are goals of the next-gen FAA system. All of these benefits can be reliably delivered by an advanced sounder in geostationary orbit. Uh, Unfortunately, due to the reasons that Eric described and for budgetary reasons and other satellites, the advanced sounder was canceled on GOES-R. And uh, NOAA did assess some alternatives, which I'm going to try to, um, did, did assess some alternatives to restore the capability, which included flying a full capability sounder, flying a reduced legacy-like sounder, flying no sounder at all, and letting the European 
weather agency develop an advanced sounder and purchasing either the data or the sounder from the Europeans. Uh, compared to these options, we feel a commercial approach can provide the needed data years earlier and with minimal cost and risk. In 2010, GeoMetWatch applied for and received a commercial remote sensing license from the Department of Commerce to operate six hyperspectral imaging sounders. The GeoMetWatch sounder will equal or exceed NOAA's requirements when flown over the, and when flown over the U.S. will restore the full benefits of the Gozar sounding mission. This sounder will provide continuous coverage for severe weather and vastly improve our ability to predict tornadoes, hurricane landfall, and intensification. And it has been mentioned before by others, these benefits can now be evaluated through use of OSSEs, which NOAA can do. Mr. Chairman, we at GeoMetWatch are excited about the future of weather technology and the role of the private sector to dramatically improve the ability of NOAA and the Weather Service to predict severe weather in the United States. We encourage NOAA to promptly undertake OSSEE experiments to validate the advantages of the geostationary system uh, we've uh, uh, described. And we had also encouraged the committee to consider legislation to clarify the authorities of NOAA uh, and, and clarify their ability to uh, acquire meteorological data and confirm the private sector's critical role in improving severe weather forecasting while saving lives and strengthening our economy. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, sir. Now recognize our third witness, Mr. Bruce Lev, to present his testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Miller. Member Miller and Mr. Bartlett, thank you all for inviting AIRDAT uh, to testify today. We are deeply grateful and honored to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, we're going to bring the conversation from 22,000 miles up a little bit closer to the ground right now. Uh, we are pleased to have a chance to talk about uh, the need to improve weather forecasting in this, in this country. Uh, as everyone knows, accurate and timely weather information can save lives, reduce injuries, save the taxpayers billions of dollars in costs that are sometimes associated with the misallocation of resources attributable to inaccurate or untimely weather forecasts. In our view, the single most critical component of the forecasting process is the ability to collect a vast quantity of very accurate, and the phrase very accurate is significant, lower atmospheric observations with high space-time resolution. Despite the numerous data collection systems deployed by NOAA, it may not surprise anyone in this room that our country is still extremely undersampled. NOAA's forecast models are sophisticated, but the success of even the most advanced forecasting system depends entirely on the quantity and quality of the observations used as input. Without accurate data from critical regions, even the most cutting edge computer models and the most talented forecasters can be significantly limited in their ability to provide a reliable forecast, particularly when the weather is volatile. AIRDAT addresses this observational space-time deficiency by deploying an atmospheric observing system called TAMDAR. The TAMDAR system delivers unique real-time, emphasize real-time, high-resolution meteorological data for improved analysis and weather forecasting. The system is comprised of a multifunction sensor which has been installed on several hundred currently flying commercial aircraft, real-time global satellite communications which provides aircraft tracking, and computer processing which rapidly extracts knowledge from extremely large data sets. Important to note, TAMDAR was developed in collaboration with NOAA, NASA, and the FAA and could today augment the National Weather Service's important balloon program. The limited number of balloon sites in the United States, we only have 69 launch sites, and they only launch twice a day, produces an average geographical data void of approximately 46,000 square miles, and a temporal void of 12 hours, launching only twice a day. This space-time observational data gap can result in inaccurate and untimely forecasts. In a four-year FAA-funded NOAA data denial study, a term you've heard earlier today, TAMDAR has been fully vetted by NOAA and exceeds all of NOAA's rigorous quality assurance standards. TAMDAR data are as accurate as balloon data, and the study has demonstrated those data significantly improve weather forecasting. 
the displayed sl slide, which is before you and before the audience, indicates the significant improvements concluded in the four-year NOAA-conducted data denial study. Additionally, the volume of TAMDAR data is approximately 40 times greater than the balloon data at less than one-tenth of the cost per sounding. Mr. Chairman, our TAMDAR system has been fully operational since 2005 and stands immediately ready to assist NOAA in improving its weather forecasting capability. Thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to chat with you today, and obviously we'd be delighted to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I now uh, recognize our final witness, Dr. Moore, for five minutes to present your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to testify on the importance of continuing innovation to improve weather forecasting and warning. I'm Dr. Barry and Moore, Vice President for Weather and Climate Programs at the University of Oklahoma, as well as the Director of the National Weather Center and Dean of the University's College of Atmospheric and Geographic Sciences. These positions are new for me. I've been at Oklahoma only since June of 2010, and therefore I'm a later rather than a sooner. I appear today largely because of my responsibilities as the Director of the National Weather Center However, however, this said, the views expressed in today's testimony are my own. I'm very appreciative of this opportunity to discuss the continuing need to use more sophisticated observational systems to help improve weather forecasting by integrating local surface data, known as mesoscale observations or mesonet, uh, to help protect life and property before severe weather ev events providing precious additional warning time that can often mean the difference between life and death. Weather is, not something that, weather is something that Oklahoma knows well, and as a consequence, it is not surprising that in 1990, the University of Oklahoma, Oklahoma State University, joined forces with the governor of the state of Oklahoma with an investment of approximately $3 million dollars and deployed what today is a 120 station statewide network that includes detailed weather observations in every one of Oklahoma's 77 counties. At each site, the environment is measured by a set of instruments located on a 10 meter tower, delivering observations every five minutes, 24 hours a day, year round. We provide a state of the art observational weather system paid for and largely maintained with non-federal funds, with a, set of, with a surface weather observations that are reported more frequently and with more localized predictive value than those provided by the National Weather Service. Taken together, the data from the National Weather Service and the Oklahoma Mesonate complement and strengthen the predictive value of each network's information, making for a powerful partnership. It is an ideal model in these financially, physically constrained times on how best to leverage investment from multiple entities to maximize the delivery of high quality information at a reasonable cost, benefiting taxpayers and communities that depend upon more accurate weather forecasts. But does this mean that we do not need weather satellites? Certainly not. As important as the Oklahoma Mesonet is, it tells us little about the Pacific Ocean. It tells us little about the weather over Europe. Weather is global. The interests of the United States, including its business and citizens, are global. And hence, the US weather observing system must be global. The weather observing system must be a network of networks, satellites, aircraft, balloons, and ground-based mesonets. The concept of a national mesonet has been validated scientifically on a number of occasions, most notably in the pathfinding report in 2009 by the National Academy of Sciences from the ground up, a, nation, a nationwide network of networks. I want to just single out two quotes. One, the report found an, over, an overarching national strategy is needed to integrate disparate systems from which far greater benefit could be derived to define the additional observations required to achieve a truly multipurpose network at the national scope. And second, which is particularly relevant today, 
Several steps are required to evolve from a current circumstance of disparate networks to an integrated, coordinated network of networks. First, it is necessary to firmly establish a consensus among providers and users that a network of networks will yield benefits in proportion to or greater than the effort required to establishment. This consensus building step is essentially political. Uh, last fall, NOAA launched uh, a campaign called a Weather Ready Nation. Let me state clearly and for the record, America will only become a weather ready nation if we increase the number of observations used to make meteorological forecasting more accurate and more precise, and then work with the public and local decision makers to act upon those improved forecasts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. Reminding members of committee rules limit questioning to five minutes. The chair will at this point open the round of questions. I recognize myself for the first five minutes. Uh, Mr. Webster, your testimony stated that NOAA should consider fixed price procurements for satellite instruments. Uh, why would fixed price be better than the current systems and would ITT be willing to bid for fixed price instrument contracts? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, fixed price contracts allow the contractors to set the requirements so we can build an instrument in the most cost effective way. Um, it's usually actually cheaper for the government because the risk and the cost is borne by the, the company, not by the government. So you don't have the dramatic increases in costs. Um, or if you do, it's, it's the company's uh, standpoint, not, not from the government standpoint. Um, these are most effective when you've actually built, uh, uh, developed an instrument already. Most companies wouldn't want to do a development contract necessarily on a fixed price. But once you've built one of an instrument, you should be um, more able to, to reproduce them and manufacture them. So from ITT's perspective, we have bid several contracts for fixed price. Um, we're taking copies of the U.S. instruments and then making them for the international community for Japan. Uh, we're under contract currently right now with Japan. That was a fixed price um, job. Hopefully Korea, potentially Canada. Um, so yes, we would certainly bid fixed price okay. contracts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Moore, in your written testimony, I used to say Dr. Moore, in your written testimony you state that, uh, quote, because surface measurement technologies have only matured over the last decade, NOAA has built its observational forecasting largely on the basis of information from satellites and radars. And I, I think you summarized some of the most significant maturations and improvements in surface measurement technologies. But what findings might be uncovered with regard to the relative value of those recently improved technologies if NOAA were to increase its number of what they what were called the observing systems simulation experiments or OSSEs? I mean, do you think that, that there would be, uh, we'd uncover some rel the, rel the true relative value of those techniques? Yes, I think we would. And as I pointed out in my testimony, uh, NOAA saw the wisdom of uh, establishing ground base. Uh, that's why there are 1,200 ground base stations uh, through a program that costs about $5 billion. Uh, from the private sector, uh, you could uh, increase that coverage to 8,000 stations at a fraction of the cost. So you, you, you believe that uh, we, they, sh they should do more of these simulation experiments? Yes, and I think she, they should, excuse me, uh, I think they should, and they should directly take into consideration uh, what can be obtained from uh, this very dense network in 26 states uh, with 8,000 locations. Uh, uh, most of the ground-based systems that NOAA established were at commercial airports because of a joint program with the FAA. Uh, that doesn't necessarily get you the kind of coverage in the state of Oklahoma that you need. Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Webster, again, you mentioned NOAA should increase the use of simulation tools such as OSSEs and the requirements for polar imagers should be a candidate for reevaluation. Now, why do you think, if you do, that NOAA should re-examine polar imagers when the VIRS is now flying and working on the NPP satellite? Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think in terms of the cost and the continued technical risk of the instrument that's flying today named, uh, called VIRS, um, unofficial estimates are that it costs uh, upwards of a billion dollars to build the first one. And I, the estimates of the second one are several hundred million dollars. Um, as I mentioned, ITT has built the legacy imager called AVHRR, um, which is about the size of a roll-on suitcase. Um, we've uh, offered to, to modify the instrument to make it more capable, um, probably for costs under $50 million. 
Um, so I think a study of what an enhanced AVHRR would provide versus what the VIRS provides for weather forecasting. There's some capabilities on a climate um, perspective that VIRS does that we know our instrument probably couldn't do. But from a weather forecasting mission, if we could do 85 or 90 percent of that capability for less than one-tenth of the cost, I believe it's at least worth a study. A study. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Crane, could you describe the potential of hyperspectral sounders to improve our ability to protect against severe weather outbreaks such as tornadoes? And how does that uh, potential compare to the severe weather forecasting contributions of the polar orbiting satellites? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, th the key advantage of a geo system is that it is stationary over the U.S. So a geostationary hyperspectral system over the U.S. can continually monitor evolving severe weather, where a polar orbiting will get a snapshot six hours, 12 hours later, we'll get another snapshot with no knowledge in the intervening time period. So for in the case of advanced sounding, the J JPSS has an advanced sounder. It has a hyperspectral sounder. But it makes one sample every, every six hours. In that same time period, a geostationary hyperspectral could take tens to thousands of soundings in the same region. So if we have emerging severe weather, we can see its evolution with much more finer resolution than we would see from a single or even multiple polar uh, satellites. And thank you very much. I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Miller. Uh, Mr. Crane, uh, your testimony is that uh, GeoMet Watch, uh, your company, uh, is confident that you can avoid the problem of a possible weather data gap uh, and that you can launch late 2015 or early 2016, um, which seems to be just in time to avoid the, um, the gap. Um, given the problems that we have had, um, why is it that you feel sure that um, your company can do so much better, launch earlier, um, and what assurance do we have that you will be able to meet a uh, time frame that when other contractors um, have slipped that their schedule? Thanks for the question. And do, uh, do you have a launch vehicle? Yes. The situation that we're in right now, we actually have a contractual agreement or a, an agreement to launch our first satellite over Asia at 110 East, which is approximately over Japan in the 2015-2016 time period. We potentially have some, some slack in the schedule that we could also accommodate a U.S. mission in, in roughly that same time period. Uh, the reason we can do this, we feel we can do this at a, at a low cost and risk is we are leveraging about $300 million of previous NASA and NOAA investment in a hyperspectral sounder for GEO that was uh, developed uh, through Langley uh, and was built at, at Utah State University. That, that instrument is the basis of our commercial sounder and uh, we will be, we will be uh, procuring that sounder under a fixed price contract as described by uh, Eric. Uh, so that's why we have confidence so we can deliver it on time and, and at, a, at, a, at a cost that's known to us. The other advantage of this approach is we're really only responsible for building that sensor. We're teaming with a, with a large commercial communication satellite provider and operator in Asia. We're, 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 we're teaming with one of the largest uh, uh, satellite bus manufacturers in the world, Taos Alenia, North America. Uh, so we have, a, we have a really good team that, that's going to bring their best commercial practices to fore to help us do this on, on, on a commercial basis. Right. Um, um, Mr. Webster, um, ITT um, uh, is, is obviously um, the prime contractor for the satellite programs. Um, do you agree that a stationary satellite a stationary orbit satellite uh, can provide the data that we are looking for from the, the uh, total orbiting satellites. 
Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Miller. I think to clarify, the, the gap that you talk about is in the polar orbiting. Right. Right. So I think what uh, Dr. Crane has been talking about in terms of a geo sounder would not get you that global coverage that the polar sounder would give. Um, but the increase in capability would be most um, useful for U.S. severe storm forecasting uh, on, a, on a now casting basis, as, as Dr. Crane said. So I think the, the need of a uh, of a um, the potential gap in the polar orbit is is still going to be there. It's undiminished. Um, um, and and have we had the same problems with the stationary uh, orbiting satellites that we've had with the with the polar? Um, Historically, um, yes, if you go back uh, 15 or 20 years, there was a huge um, shift in technology from, from an actually spinning satellite to one that was three-axis stabilized so it could actually stare at the right. U.S. That was in the, the, the late 80s when ITT actually first started building the instrument. So we haven't been the prime contractor. We've been the, um, the prime instrument provider uh, for the companies. The current um, GOES program is, is up and working well. And we're working on the next generation um, of instruments right now, and, and so far we are still on schedule. Um, costs have been uh, growing in the program, but it's also because of, of technical changes um, that, that the, the government has wanted along with, with some, some issues we've had uh, on our end. But we're still w within the, the overall scope that the um, NOAA has budgeted for the program. Okay. And, and I'm sure you heard the testimony of the first panel about the way in which the data from various sources complement each other. Um, uh, do, you, do you agree that, uh, uh, well, do you believe that the uh, polar orbiting satellites data uh, can be replaced, uh, can, can be done without uh, with additional uh, stationary satellite, stationary or, orbit satellites or further ground sensors? I, I think if, uh, you know, from, in, in terms of what Dr. Crane's been trying to propose with GeoMetWatch, if they had six geostationary sounders that circled the globe, you, you could get that type of coverage. Um, one or two would not get you the global data that's critical to the global um, forecast models. And as, as Mary Kiza had mentioned, 90 percent of the data in the forecast models is satellite-based data, and most of that comes from polar sounders because it actually gets the global coverage. In terms of, of mesonets or in situ measurements, they are um, very critical for the finer resolution models and near-term forecasting. So again, the polar sounders important for two to five day forecasts to tell you where severe weather might be in the southeast or in North Carolina. You might get a, a tornado in a couple of days. But as you get closer to that actual warning and forecast, that's when your radars and your mesonets and your in situ measurements come into a much, uh, uh, much higher fidelity. As Mr. Murphy uh, mentioned from the National Weather Service, the forecaster uses the model to set the parameters, and then as he's forecasting, uses all the in situ data to actually provide the warnings. So the difference is between the general forecast versus the actual warning. Okay. My time's expired. Thank you very much. I now recognize the other gentleman from Maryland, Dr. Bartlett. Thank you, sir. Uh, could we not uh, place uh, geospatial satellites in uh, orbit such that they could stare at all the Earth? Uh, we, I gather, have the uh, uh, orbiting satellites because they provide a more detailed look at, uh, at weather, and so it provides us data in more uh, detail. I gather that we're looking at uh, things from four different uh, perspectives, one from way out there, 22,000 miles, and from five hundred miles. And then we have a lot of ground-based stations. I remember several years ago I was working with our um, schools, all many of which have weather stations, many of them collecting data at, as good as the weather collected at the airport. And since, as you mentioned, in Oklahoma, you don't have airports in enough places to really provide wide coverage. And I don't know, can't remember now how we failed to get uh, NOAA to look at these uh, schools because there are many thousands of these across the country and with a little coaching they could provide I would think much more uh, detailed and uh, broadly dispersed uh, data input from the ground. But then we have that uh, uh, mid-level that uh, Mr. Lev talked about in his testimony and uh, that's 
between the ground and those 500 mile satellites and we collect a little bit of data there with a few balloons that we send up from what's only 63 places and then only twice a day so it's there's huge gaps in the in in the, uh, coverage both in time and and spatial coverage with that but so I understand that um, the use of um, of your technology Tamdar uh, does not just produce relatively better weather forecasting but dramatically better weather forecasting is that correct the uh, slide we had up when I was uh, giving my formal testimony Mr. Bartlett and thank you for the question uh, reflects the conclusions that NOAA itself derived from its own data denial study conducted over four years which was actually funded by the FAA having a considerable interest in uh, high resolution highly accurate weather forecasts those results from a classic data denial study when we had many fewer aircraft flying than we have today indicated that in the significant meteorological parameters particularly moisture which is a key driver of short-term weather forecasts that we improve the reliability and accuracy of forecasts by up to 50 percent, five zero percent. Those are uh, uh, certainly from our perspective and I think at the time from NOAA's GSD division uh, considerably surprising and much greater than anyone thought might be the case. It turns out that as we add more aircraft the, and improve the, uh, the, uh, the, type, the type of modeling we're doing in terms of ingesting data, the uh, reliability and accuracy has actually improved beyond 50 percent in many respects. I gather that your uh, technology simply hitchhikes on the planes that are there anyhow for other purposes? That is correct. Uh, one of the key issues in getting more data in the lower atmosphere, if you will, is you can't fly more balloons. They do get in the way of airplanes, and we have a lot more airplanes today than we had when the balloon program started almost 75 years ago. The only way to get good data, and that's what's critical, is good accurate data, is to hitchhike on aircraft. Uh, and that's what we do. We are, in fact, flying balloons, but we don't get in the way of anyone else. And we send that data in real time. It doesn't take 90 minutes to collect the data that is collected by the balloons, the radiosons, as they rise into the atmosphere. How big are these devices, and um, how much do they compromise the vehicle in which they are attached? Uh, in the commercial configuration, uh, the entire uh, system weighs well under 10 pounds. Thus, it doesn't uh, compromise the aircraft in any sh shape, form, or manner, which is why uh, 10 or more airlines have been delighted to have us install on their commercial aircraft. In uh, a, an unmanned aerial vehicle uh, con configuration, where, and we have been flying on drones to comment on something that was offered up earlier uh, in, in other testimony, uh, we're down to, uh, I think, about a pound or less with uh, special uh, materials, carbon fiber and the like. Uh, it's actually uh, a non, it's nominal. It's a non-event with respect to size, shape, or weight. What uh, vehicle do you use for transmitting this data to, the, uh, to where it's processed? The data comes off the sensor installed on the aircraft and is immediately sent in real time to the Iridium satellite network, uh -huh. a relatively well-known satellite network used both commercially and by the Department of Defense, by the way, sent in real time to, um, to our processing center, but could be sent anywhere on the planet, uh, including to NOAA's processing centers, if uh, they so choose. Thank you. Now you're back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And I, I want to thank the witnesses for your valuable testimony, again, for your patience uh, as we started late, and the members for their questions. The members of the committee may have additional questions for you, and we will ask you to respond to those in writing. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments from members. The witnesses are excused. Thank you all for being here today. The hearing is now adjourned. Okay, thank you. Here you go. What do you want to do?